Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. So at the end of creation, God has built everything in the universe, quasars and black holes and galaxies so far out we'll never even see them. He built stuff on the other side of the universe that humans will never even see with their eyes, but it doesn't matter because everything's built for the glory of God, not for people's curiosity. So God built everything for himself, this glorious universe he built with the word of his mouth. And on the seventh day, so he builds everything in six days, doesn't have to take six days, it shouldn't have taken him so long, but he does it for a weird reason, and we're going to look at that in a second, and on the seventh day, he takes a total break. And on the seventh day, verse 2, God finished his work he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work he had done. So, God blessed the seventh day and made it what? Holy, circle holy in your Bible. Because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. So what's interesting in our society is you usually run on one side or the other of work, which is you're lazy, you need to get a J-O-B, you're healthy, your body works, your mind works, but you don't want to work. You'd rather live off the government or off of mom and dad. And so you don't want to go do those things, so you sit at home or you just go play instead of work. So last week we looked at the value of working. God expects you to work. If you're able-bodied and able-minded, go to work. It'll, it'll bring pleasure to your own soul and you'll be able to make money so that not only can you bless yourself, but you can bless other people. Lazy people can't bless anyone, even themselves. They live off the benefit of other people, which is unbiblical and ungodly, and don't do it. So that's basically the sermon from last week in, one, in two, two sentences. This week, however, is different. This week is, once you've worked, does God expect you to work to death? Does God expect you to grind it out to the point of unhealth? So where do we find that limit? Where do we find the moment of... <sighs> of rest. How do we know when we should rest? Let's look at it. Number one, rest is required. Rest is required. So we're closing up this series today. Elements, we're finished with 20, what is this, 22 weeks. When I started this series, some of you guys had hair and <laughs> some of you guys weren't even married back when I started this series. Like Jesus was even younger back in that day. But we're closing up this shop today on this series. And uh, next week, we're going to look at um, uh, the week before Easter, and then obviously Easter Resurrection Day, we're going to look at that. So today, we close up. And we're going to close up on one of the things that you may never even have thought of, is God's view of rest. So we looked at work last week, and now we're going to look at taking a rest for God. But rest is required. Working in labor isn't a necessary evil of life but a way of glorifying God. So that's what we looked at last week. Even land was expected to produce or it was viewed as worthless. So even in the Bible, God expected land, an inanimate, unwilled type of thing, dirt, to be productive. And if it wasn't, if it was like a desert or sandy or whatever, it was viewed as worthless or cursed. So even God expects the land to be productive. He expects people to be productive. He expects even inanimate dirt to be productive. He, in other words, he doesn't even expect dirt to be lazy. <coughs> However, God didn't expect people, animals, or land to be worked to death, but to rest from producing also. In his mercy, he told Israel, the nation of Israel, his people in the Old Testament, and their animals to take a day off every six days, and the land to take a day off every six years. This might surprise you. So in the law, which we're going to look at in a second, God brings up this thing called the Sabbath or the Sabbath in, in Hebrew. It's the idea that you take a rest. It's an intermission. So Sabbath literally means an intermission, a, a, a spot of rest. 
How many of you guys have ever been to a play? Like a really lame, like junior high play or a high school play? Maybe you wanted to be there. Maybe it was your kid and you go, I better go. Uh, or you went to the Pantages Theater. And that, you know, it took you four hours to get downtown LA to watch Lion King or whatever. So I've been to the Pantages a couple times. Beautiful theater. And if you've ever been to a play, you know that after a while, the curtain comes down. But the play's not over. But you've seen a bunch of stuff. You've heard some singing or whatever's happened on stage. And now all of a sudden, it's called intermission. So you get to get up, stretch your back, go have some popcorn, go out into the uh, foyer, (laughs) and talk to the other cultured people of the world. So this is, this is intermission. It's intermission. So watch. It doesn't mean the play's over. It doesn't mean the musical's over. It just means that it's a time for the singers to rest their voices. It's a time for the play production guys to get, drink some Gatorade and hang out and, and get ready for the next scene or whatever it is. So watch. Sabbath is exactly that word in the Hebrew. It doesn't mean you're, you're done done. It means there's an intermission. It's a time of rest. You stop. Stop. Stop and rest. So in the law, God expected people to work hard for six days and then rest on the seventh day. So here's the biblical mandate. Ready? Work hard and rest well. Work hard and rest well. The biblical mandate for you isn't work till you're dead. The biblical mandate isn't for you don't work at all. It's work hard, do the best you can with whatever abilities God gives you, but then rest well. So rest is required from God. See, many of us that are workaholics or we find our joy in working, we, our mind even right now as I'm speaking to you is going, what do I have to get done? Okay, that thing at home, okay, I got to get that done. Okay, yeah, the lawn, yeah, the dog took a dump on the couch. I got to clean that up when we get home. Uh, gosh, my stocks, I got to make sure we hit that because, you know, when, the, when the, the stock exchange opens on Monday morning, dude, I got to be up at the crack of dawn to make sure I sell that, that stock. I was got the, in other words, your mind's always in, in make money mode or it's always in get this done mode. I'm going to tell you something. You need to rest in God because rest is required. It's not a suggestion. God made you to rest. He told his people, Israel, you work six days, but you are required to have a Sabbath. You're required to have an intermission in your work. What that means is you don't think about it. You don't do it. You don't, you're not occupied with it. You absolutely decompress from work. Not a suggestion, a requirement for Israel, but it's even for us today, not on a specific day, because we don't have to worry about the law anymore, but the Sabbath requirement of a rest time for your body and your mind and your soul is still on us today. He told Israel and the animals to take a day off every six days and the land to take a year off every six years. So look at uh, Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. I got it here on the screen. It says this. This is what God said to his people. Remember the Sabbath day or the intermission day to keep it holy That means holy means set apart. It means special. It means unlike the other six days, you do something different on the other day, on the seventh day. It's holy. It's set apart. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath or an intermission to the Lord your God. On it, on that day, you shall not do any work, you, your son, your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days, the Lord made the heaven and the earth. So God builds the whole universe in six days. He could have just did it in an instant. He didn't have to take six days. He could have just said done. But he takes six days to make sure the framework is there of working hard and then resting on a seventh day. For he made the earth and the sea and all that is in and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, because of that, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Hey, you want to know something? Think about this for a second. What is the reason we have a seven-day work week? What's the the reason we have a seven-day week time frame? Anybody know? There is no reason. You know the reason? So when you flip your calendar open, do you ever wonder why almost every month is 30 days? Why don't we have a 10-day week? So we just have three weeks of 10. Wouldn't that be clean and beautiful? Instead, you look at your calendar and it's all... Why in the world are we dividing 30 by 7? For those of us that are tough with math, we're like, what is that? It's like four points. That's three points. What is that? 
four, 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 five, what is it? You want to know something bizarre? Listen to me, listen. You know something bizarre? Is we know why we have 24 hours. We know why we have 30 days. We know why we have a year. But we have no idea why we have seven days. You want to know why? Because it's not astronomical. It's not cultural. Almost every culture has a seven-day week. You know what's bizarre about that? Is there's not a reason to have seven days. Other than this, it's imprinted into life that God built everything in six days and rested on the seventh. There's zero reason for why we have a seven-day work week, astronomically or any other reason. So when you look at the calendar, if you're an atheist and you look at the calendar, you're looking at God. Every time you look at your calendar, you go, why is this calendar so jacked up? Why can't we just have three weeks of 10? Like three days in a week, or three, 10 days in a week. Three of those every month. Why don't we, in other words, why isn't it the metric system? rather than 12 inches in a foot. Why do, we, you know, why do we keep to the old ways that's dysfunctional when it comes to math? I'll tell you why. Because God set a standard that you work six days and you take a seventh day off. Every time you look at the calendar, it screams God. Because there's not a reason we have seven days other than what Scripture says about God's work and rest. Now look at this. So if you're in Genesis, turn to Leviticus. It's a couple books away from Genesis. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Turn to Leviticus 25. So this might surprise you. Remember when I talked about land? God says, people work six days, take a seventh day off. He says for the land, work your land six years and give it a whole year off. Now think about this. If you're a farmer, think about not working your land for a year. Almost every culture pre-industrial age has been agrarian. You live off the land. You live off animals. Your animals live off the land. Unless you're a trader or a merchant, but you're still tied to the land because you're trading in things that usually come out of the land. Now think about it. If you've ever been on a farm, grandpa owns a farm, you own a farm, you grew up on a farm, man, to think about letting your land sit there and do nothing, what's the very first question you think of when, when you hear from God, I don't want you to, to, make, to work the land for a year. How am I feeding my kids? How am I feeding my family? God actually answers that question. Look at this. Leviticus 25, verses 1 through 5. The Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land that I give you, the land shall keep a Sabbath, an intermission to the Lord. For six years you shall sow your field, and for six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather in its fruits. But in the seventh year, there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall not sow your field or prune your vineyard. You shall not reap what grows of itself in your harvest or gather the grapes of your undressed vine. It shall be a year of solemn rest for the land. Think about it. How am I going to live, God, for a year if you don't let me till the land? God actually answers that question in Leviticus 25, 20. So God anticipates that question. Look what he says. And if you say, what shall we eat in the seventh year if we may not sow or gather in our crop? Look at verse 21, underline it. I will command my blessing on you in the sixth year so that it will produce a crop sufficient for three years. When you sow in the eighth year, you will be eating some of the old crop. You shall eat the old until the ninth year when, that, when its crop arrives. You know what that means? That means this. God controls the production that you have in your life, not you. You think you work hard, and I believe you do. You're intelligent, and I believe you are. But understand this. The, the money you make from your labor or whatever you get from your labor is a gift from God whether he gives you seven, eight digits worth a year or whether he gives you $8 an hour. Listen, your pro listen to what I'm saying. Your production, what you get from your labor, doesn't come from you. It comes from the blessing of God. So even Israel was supposed to let their land rest a whole year. How would they eat for that year? Because God in the sixth year gave them three years worth of food. So in other words, God's the God of production, not you. So what, what does that mean for you? That means that work hard, but, but rest well. Because rest knowing God's got your back if you honor him. Not your portfolio, not your businesses. 
Jesus is talking right now. He's telling you what I'm telling you is the truth. Speaking right out of a phone. It's amazing. God uses all things. Look at this. Just as God didn't have to take as long as six days to create the universe, neither did he really have to rest on the seventh day. So God wasn't tired. God builds everything in six days. and he didn't, God didn't sit back on the couch and go, do I need a break? Time the heck out. I'm exhausted from building quasars and gorillas and ocean animals. Wow, where's Netflix? <laughs> it's time to Netflix and chill is what time it is for God. Nope. You know why God, God didn't have to rest? Because he spoke everything into existence. He didn't like have to hammer and bang it out. He wasn't physically exhausted. What he did was he said, I'm going to do this as a pattern for humanity, which is why we have seven days and there's not even a reason to have seven days, a seven-day work week or seven day, you know, six days to work and one day to rest. It doesn't even make sense. But God showed us how we're supposed to live our lives. Even God rested and he didn't even have to. He did both to give humanity a pattern on how to live, work hard and be productive, and rest completely and be at peace. Do you need peace this morning? You stressed out about your finances? You stressed out about like, even right now as you sit here, you're going, I gotta take care of that thing. Listen, listen to, li listen to me. If you can't discipline your mind to listen to God's word for 40 minutes, shame on you. That means you got too much stuff going on in your head. That means you need to decompress the things that are taking the priority. If you're thinking about other things than, than, than God's word right now, that means that there's other things battling for your attention. Following God is the most important thing, but yet we allow stuff to get in the way of God. And that shows you that your priorities are out of whack because you're, 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 the discipline of your mind strays. And in our culture, it's really easy because right now, if you're on your phone or whatever, you're thinking about what's the latest thing, what, you know, what's up on Twitter, what's, what's the latest highlight, what, you know, what's happened in Sweet 16, blah, 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 blah. It shows you that your mind strays when it's not disciplined for the things of God. If you need to rest in the Lord, what that means is you don't worry about anything else, including your finances, because God's got your back. You don't have to work yourself to death. You don't have to work seven days a week. You work hard, but you rest well. Number one, rest is required. Number two, rest is to rejuvenate. Rest is to rejuvenate. There is no scientific understanding of why humans sleep or rest other than it seems to be designed to help humans be productive. You know what I know it's bizarre? Is you spend a third of your life unconscious. What? Oh, some of you spend more time than that, unconscious, maybe even at work. But isn't it crazy? Listen, if God was like, hey, you know what? Keep working. Work yourself to death. Hey, you know what? Keep doing that thing. Work, work, work. If that was his MO for you to work yourself to death, he wouldn't have made you sleep. God is so interested in your sleep because he loves you that he builds into your life a cycle of sleep. You know, what, you know what's weird? Same thing with the seven-day week. There's not a reason you sleep. Did you know scientifically? They can't figure out why humans sleep. In other words, there's not a part. Your brain keeps going while you're asleep. Your heart keeps going while you're asleep. Your lungs keep going while you're asleep. There's not a reason for you to go, I need to go unconscious for a few hours and unplug. <laughs> Science has no answer for that. We have no idea why you sleep other than God makes you sleep so that you can be more productive. If you don't learn how to rest, you're going to burn out. And burnout destroys your life because you only have so much energy. You are built to rest. Unless you're on methamphetamines and you're up for like three or four days. You do some crack and you keep rebuilding your bike. <laughs> I got to build this bike, got to build this bike, got to build... What are you doing? I got to build this bike. I got to build this bike. And here's the point. Even after your methamphetamine binge, your body goes, I'm done. So even if you abuse your body with drugs, your body is still, in other words, you can't indefinitely go without sleep. You're built to rest. You can push yourself to a limit for a while, but after a while, your body goes, I'm done. 
And that's, that's God's way of your body telling you, you need to rejuvenate. I'm going to burn out. God knew that people, animals, and land didn't have limitless energy. So he created rest to avoid burnout, anger, bitterness, hopelessness, and worthlessness. Hey, guess what? Are you an angry person? You might not be, but guess what happens when you get exhausted? You, you lose control of your mouth. You lose control of your physical uh, things that you do when you get angry. Maybe you're a person that when you get angry, man, just vomit comes out of your mouth verbally. It's just, it's profanity. It's just vulgarity. You tear people down. You just get angry and it just, just the vomit from your heart just comes spewing out. Or maybe you're not a, maybe you're not a yeller profanity person. Maybe you are a pick up anything close to me, whether it's the kids or a plate, and everything goes flying. Or maybe you like Tron that throws plates, you know, across the... <laughs> anybody remember Tron from the 80s? Okay. Yeah. But the point being, watch, if you're exhausted, it doesn't matter if you're not... I'm not, a, I'm not an angry person. Guess what? How, how you know that you're exhausted is when you come to a point where you're, you're always at a simmer, getting ready to blow. Oh, what? What, what, what did you say? <laughs> I didn't say anything. Okay, cool. Wait, what? What? Always looking for a fight. Always waiting, for, oh, always waiting to fight because you want an excuse to blow up. And that often happens when you're exhausted. When you're, at, when you're, in, the, when you're in the mode of burnout, you just go into, I'm going to rip everyone's head off. One, that's sinful and ungodly because God expects you to self-regulate. God expects you to control your mouth. God expects you to control what you do physically. God expects you to self-regulate yourself. He, sh he doesn't expect the cops to come and regulate you. He expects you to control yourself. How do you get out of control? When you feel like you're in burnout mode and you just, you give up. You're like, I, whatever. Whatever with my marriage, whatever with my job, whatever with my kids, whatever. I'm just gonna burn the whole world to the ground. That's how you know that your life's out of whack because you haven't rejuvenated your mind or your body, you've gone into the reserves of your life and you totally torched your, torched your own self. You're not built for that. You're built to rest so that you can control your mouth, you can control your body, you can be in control of self. Anger and the violence that comes with it often comes from the fact that you just, you're burned out. You're burned out. Your, your mind is somewhere else and you haven't taken a moment to rest and recover like you should. Rest is godly. Many of us that are workaholics think uh, rest is laziness. It's not. Those are two different things. Look at this. Look at um, rest is done with purpose and on purpose. It is to recover bodily health and stability to mental, emotional, and spiritual states. I love Matthew eleven twenty eight. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 is the, is the words of Jesus. I want you to see this. Ready? Connect with this. Jesus says this, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. That means just like you're weighed down with the, with the weight of the world. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. So in other words, get rid of what the world wants you to do. I got to make a dime. Hey, while I'm awake, I better be making money. Because if I'm not making money, I'm losing money. I'm going to work till I'm dead. Listen, that road never ends. You never get to a point where you're like, okay, now I got enough money. Now I can rest. And that road never comes to a stop where you're popular enough or you got enough money or you're secure enough in your 401k. It'll never end. It never ends. So what you do is you don't say, I'm just going to keep on going until I'm dead. What you do say is, I trust God because he's the producer in my life, not me. I don't produce my finances. God produces it. So I can trust him. I know if I work hard, God will bless me so I don't have to work seven days a week. I can take a day to rest and worship God. Why? Because God's got my back. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart. In other words, not a slave driver. God's not going, keep working. Work yourself to death. Destroy your family and your health. And get heart disease and just let stress control your whole life. God doesn't even do that. God's saying, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. 
For my yoke, the things that I'm requiring of you, is easy. And my burden that I put upon you is light. The soul rest that you should feel from God is like, wow, God's got my back. I don't have to be stressed out about living. If you're stressed out about living, I encourage you to do this. Trust God. And what that means is this. God, I give you all of my anxiety. It says, cast all your cares upon him for he cares for you. That's not just mythical words. That's saying, I truly trust the God that loves me. I'm doing everything I can, but the things that I can't do, I don't stress out about. I leave to the Lord. Look at Mark 6. So turn to the back of your Bible, Matthew, Mark. It's the second book of the New Testament. Mark chapter 6. This is an amazing passage as it deals with rest. Because think about it. If you're over 33 or 34 in here, you've already lived longer than Jesus. I want you to think about something. Ready? Come with me. Don't tap out. If you're older than 34, you've already lived longer than Jesus. So what that means is this. While Jesus is on earth, you're thinking, he's going to be just going nuts. He's spending all his energy to make everything happen. He's he's only got a short amount of time before he's crucified on the cross. And guess what? He calls his disciples to him, his 12 disciples, and he's only got three years to train them. If I'm Jesus, you know what I'm saying to my 12 disciples? Everybody get Red Bull. Everybody get Red Bull. I'm going to be dead in a few years. Hey, Peter, uh, get, grab that thing. John, okay, uh, you got, uh, who's got the methamphetamines that we bought from downtown? You got that? Okay. We're going to stay awake for three years. We're not going to sleep. I'm going to teach you. We're going to learn. Because I got three years and I'm going to be dead and then I'm going to turn you loose on the world. You're going to have to change the world. You're going to have to write scripture. You're going to have a guy named Jim in Temecula that's going to be preaching this stuff in like 2,000 years. It's got to be legit, kid. (laughs) That's what I'm saying. If I'm Jesus, I'm like, okay, you guys had enough of your lives. Now I own you. For the next three years, I'm going to burn you the heck out because I've only got a little bit amount of time. Luckily, I'm not Jesus and you're not my disciple. Because look what, how Jesus handles it. Mark chapter 6, verse 30. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure to even eat. And they went away in a boat to a desolate place by themselves. You know what I love about that? is even Jesus, God in the flesh, has a limited amount of time. He's going to die as a young man in his early 30s. He's only got three years to train his boys, and he doesn't stress out about even that. He goes, come on, guys, get in a boat. We're going to go rest. Hey, Peter, build a campfire. John, grab some wood. Bartholomew, you don't do anything anyway, so just hang out here with me. (laughs) And he got all his boys around a campfire, Instead of stressing out, you guys, what's our next plan? So you know what? We're going to decompress. Peter, tell that one story about John when he fell down the stairs of the temple. I like that one. Tell that one again. (laughs) And Jesus just goes, let's rest, man. And think about the stress he could have been under. I mean, you want to talk about stress. You have no idea the stress. You got stress in your life. You had no idea the stress Jesus could have put himself under with the scenario he was in with his disciples. Unfathomable. But you know what? He says, let's rest together. Because listen, you learn a lot about a person when you work with them, but you learn more about them when you do life with them. And life is when you decompress and go, what's going on in your life, man? I love you. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad we can do life together. That happens when you're at rest, not when you're in stress. Rest and laziness aren't the same. So guess what? So you lazy people are going, hey, awesome. Pastor said I can rest some more for another couple years. Nope. Here's the the difference. Ready? Rest and laziness are two different things. Laziness is refusing to work. Rest is recovering from work. So you can't rest if you're lazy because you haven't done work. Rest is saying an intermission. I'm resting from what I've done. Lazy says I never started. You can't rest and be lazy. Those two don't go together. Number one, rest is required by God. 
you're required to rest. So much so that you're unconscious a third of your life. Number two, rest is to rejuvenate. Hey, are you, you feel burned out today? You feel like I'm totally fried. I can't even keep my mind on a sermon for 40 minutes. I'm so undisciplined because I'm thinking about money. I'm thinking about my job. I'm thinking about what I got to do when I get home. Listen, that should tell you already that your mind is fried because this is the most important thing right now is hearing from God and you're still sticking stuff in your mind that doesn't even matter tomorrow, ultimately. So we need to rejuvenate. Put your mind back together. Put your body back together. And that comes through resting. And lastly, rest is to recalibrate. Rest is to recalibrate. In pre-industrial times, so before the inventing of the machine, the time to reap land, catch fish, or trade as a merchant was limited so there was pressure to work 24-7. So imagine, I mean, machines make our life easy. You got a washing machine. Sometimes women had to take their clothes down to a, they still have to do it in some areas of the world, take them down to a river and beat the clothes on a rock. Physical labor just to wash your clothes. Now you just throw it in your thing you bought from Home Depot and just put a little tick, tick, tick. Oh, I'm so tired. <laughs> I, had to, I had to pour the fabric softener in that little cup thing. Machines make our lives easy. Get on the internet, blah, blah, blah. You can do your whole business from, in your pajamas from your, from your house. But pre-industrial times, it was stressful. Imagine, man, you don't sell something, you don't make money. Your family doesn't eat. You don't grow something out of the ground, Johnny doesn't eat tonight. You want to talk about stress of like having to work 24-7? That's stress. And God still says, nope, take a day off. Because life isn't about work, life is about worship. You either worship yourself or you worship God. When you overwork, that means you're worshiping self. I'm going to take care of myself. I'm the only one who's going to take care of my family. Not even God's got this. Both laziness and overworking are, are self-worship. Laziness says, I don't have to work. Somebody else will take care of me for me. That's saying, my, my life's more important than someone else. I worship myself when you're lazy. Or overworking on the other side of it is, I got to take care of myself. Not even God can do this for me. Both laziness and overworking is self-worship rather than God-worship. However, God demands believers to control their time, not time to control them. Woo, get ready. Get ready. God expects you to control your time, not for your time to control you. You're in control of your time. No one controls your time except you. Don't think, I got so much stuff going on. No, you have made your life have so much stuff going on. Other people haven't done that to you. You've, you've made your schedule so it burns your, your own self out. God hasn't laid any burden on you. You've laid it on yourself. You're expected to control your time, not allow time to control you. You control your schedule. Your schedule shouldn't control you. You decide what gets done when. This means rest includes taking a day to trust God by not working and worship him with others. I love Hebrews 10, 24 and 20, 25. It says that you should not neglect meeting together with the people of God. Listen, rest means worshiping together with the people of God. Right now, you should be resting, decompressing from your, from your life. Listen, Monday morning's waiting for you. You don't have to do Monday on Sunday. Right now, I'm working. I work on Sundays. After five hours of, of, of preaching and teaching, I go home and I'm like jello. I walk in the house and Julie just basically throws a blanket over me as I hit the couch and the dog comes lays by me and my wife goes to shopping. I can't even spell Jesus when I get home from these Sundays. But the reason I do it is because this is our opportunity to worship together. This is our opportunity to not worry about the world. We worship together as a people of God. I try to take every Sunday, uh, Saturday off as my own day of rest because I know Sunday I'm, gonna have, I'm working. But this is our opportunity. This is our opportunity to rest together, to hear the word of God and to worship together. Here's my point to you. If you're in town, be a church. If you're in town, be at church. And it's not for attendance sake, it's for the fact it's like you're part of the body. If your body just decided to take a day off, the body's worth, worse for it. Don't be in town and not be at church worshiping with the people of God. 
because you're vital to this church. If you're in Maui and you're resting, awesome. Go to church there too. There's sweet churches in Maui. The point is, is that worship has to be part of your life. And the people of God have to be important to you. Because you're important to the people of God. There's no specific Christian Sabbath day requirement, only that rest and worship happens. So we don't follow the Old Testament law of having, to, having a Sabbath of Saturday. That was in the law. Now we are free to worship on any day. Some parts of the world, uh, in closed countries, Christians have to worship Tuesdays. It doesn't matter when you do it. The point is you have to make it a priority. Could be Sundays, could be Tuesdays, whatever. In our culture, we meet on Sunday mornings. There is no perfect balance, just perfect priority. I'm going to wreck your shop as I end the sermon. Everybody ready? Everybody ready? You know all those women's magazines you have? Like, hey, you know what? Find balance. You need to find balance. You need to be a career woman and take care of your kids and take care of your husband and take care of your house and be a good friend to your, to your other friends. And, you, and women go, how can I find balance? Where's my 23 and 4 percent in every little area and I feel so out of whack? Guess what? I'm going to help you with that. Ready? Burn that trash. Because here's the point. There's no such thing as balance. You want to know why you can't find, can't find balance? Because it doesn't exist. It's a myth of our culture. But you know, what, you know why it's not in the Bible? Because the Bible doesn't know anything about balance. You know what it knows about? It knows about priority. There's no such thing as balance. But there is such a thing as priority. You know what your priority should be? God, family, and work. Let me help you. There's no such thing as balance. There's a thing called priority. If you are working too much so that it's in the detriment of your family, because you're not getting your family to church, that means work is out of priority. If I'm working too much, and I, if I lose my family, listen, if I lose my family because I'm doing too much ministry, my ministry is destroyed. If, I'm, if, I, if I care too much about my family, and we don't ever get to worship God, that means my family's my God, and I lose my relationship with God. Because families, more, relationships are more important than my own relationship with God. So forget balance. It's all about priority. Where's God in your life? Is it number one? How would you know that? Uh, I guess I come to church once in a while. It's not good enough. The reality is, is you've got to make him number one in your life. And then watch. Everything takes its right spot. Then you're not overworking. You can rest with your family while you worship God together. There's no such thing as balance. But the next time you hear that, just vomit in your mouth whether it's a Christian book or whether it's Oprah. There's no such thing. The reason it doesn't work is because it doesn't exist. But there is such a thing as priority. Priority will help you rest because it's all in its proper spot. God, family, and work. Work is required to live, but rest is required for living. Isn't that beautiful? Rest is required to live. So make sure you're resting well. Work hard and rest well. Because God wants the best for your life. 